Hey guys, welcome to the Source Gaming Discussion. I am your host, Epic Martin 7 and today I am joined by special guest Seafoam Gaming. Hello everyone, it's me, Seafoam Gaming. I run a retrospective and gameplay channel, which is kind of small, but I'm hoping to make it big with the retrospectives. And also, hi Scott the Waz, I hope you are listening because I really like the content. And today we're going to talk about our experiences with the Arcade Archives. Uh, collection um, of games that were released um, multiple platforms, Nintendo eShop, PlayStation Network, and just discuss what we think about them. So, uh, we'll start with you, Seafoam Gaming. Uh, what do you think of the arcade archives, and what's cool about them, what's not so cool about them? Well, for start off with, I guess we'll talk about what came technically first, the arcade archives for PS4. I actually, one of the reasons I bought a PS4 last year for $400 is because I wanted to play Gradius and all the Arcade Archives games on it. And when I got my PS4, I got Gradius and then right afterwards they announced they were going to release Arcade Archives Neo Geo for the Switch and the normal ones down the line. So my PS4 became more of a modern game machine and I've been buying lots of the Arcade Archives stuff on the Switch in the meantime. And I do think the lineup, from what it looks like on PS4 and upcoming stuff, it has great potential. They're going into the obscure gaming territory I always want from the virtual console. And I don't have to import because they're releasing Japanese-only games on the, well, North American store. They don't really care, even on PS4. Uh, not to mention, too, um, it's pretty cool how on the Switch they're actually collaborating with Nintendo to bring a lot of these obscure arcade games from their past onto the Switch. I mean, it's already cool seeing, you know, a bunch of Neo Geo games and other arcade games, but there is some really neat stuff from Nintendo's past, and one of the most um, well-known ones to be released, uh, I think in the past couple days from when we're recording this, is Versus Super Mario Brothers, which is something, you know, you don't really expect, considering that's legitimately the first version of Super Mario Brothers to be released on the Switch instead of the original, so... Yeah, it's kind of something scary slash pretty embarrassing when you release a new major Intel console and original Mario Brothers or Zelda for that matter are nowhere to be found and it's like nine months since launch and we get the obscure, like really rarely seen versus version which I w am happy for. I'll talk more about those later because I have some history with some of them. But like, most people would expect, you know, Mario Brothers, Donkey Kong, NES, and all those stuff, but now we're getting actual skill stuff in Nintendo's past. Yeah, it's it's really neat seeing that. And what's even more cool is that they there's no really distinguishment between the third-party um, arcade archives and the Nintendo ones, it, it's all universal. I mean, if you go, say, play Metal Slug, you, it has the same exact UI as um, versus Super Mario Brothers. Um, Nintendo actually allowed that, allowed Hamster to put its own twist onto it, which I think is really cool. It's also even more amusing considering how the Arcade Archives is developed by, I think, Nippon Itchy, and I think the Neo Geo stuff is developed by another part of Hamster or someone else they outsource it to, but they both have the same UI. The Arcade Archives for the normal games actually didn't start out with the high school and caravan mode. They were literally just the original game and the multiple regions. Actually no, the multiple regions came later. Wygar, one of the very first, if not the first arcade archives game, was just the game and a high school leaderboard. A lot of people bought them on PS4 for the trophies because they have some of the stupidest achievement and trophy lists in the entire world. You, in the old arcade archives games, you get a trophy for reading the manual, for changing the buttons, for opening the game setting option and resetting the game. Like actually hitting the reset option gives you an achievement and of course uploading the high score to the leaderboard but not an, a certain high score, just any. So they were really lazy and generic with the early batch of arcade archive stuff. But on the PS4, it's a bit, and well, Xbox One for that matter, they made things a bit better because the fact that for the arcade archives, now they just have it so that there's only a few trophies and they're all for getting points. A certain amount of points per game and getting a new score and high score in caravan mode. 
That's it. Well, at least they're making improvements to it instead of allowing trophy hunters uh, a field day. <laughs> well, even the new trophies are technically easy, but some games like Crazy Climber 2 are kind of hard to get all of them. But there's only like 6, so on the PS4 you don't get much, but on the Xbox One X, they all have the equivalent of a Platinum Trophy, which is kind of silly considering how you could basically make the Xbox One level wise to the top just from playing arcade games and getting high scores. Yeah, I mean, it's also interesting if you're ever a person playing on the Switch considering Nintendo doesn't even have an achievement system. Which I consider kind of criminal, honestly, but ironically, the Neo Geo slash Arcade Archive stuff is one of the few multi-platform games I don't mind buying on a Switch because, well, the team is suck on the other systems and the replay value for me comes from high scores. Right, which is the whole point of these old arcade games. You would think that achievements were there to entice people to get scores, but considering the achievements anyhow are kind of underwhelming, it doesn't really make it doesn't really matter um, if you're playing it on Switch or PS4, really. Even though they're making efforts to make it better. Yeah, I, the weird part is, as of the day we are filming this, 14 hours from now, Japan is going to get Arcade Archives Double Dragon, which was part of the first wave of Arcade Archives games, meaning they had the crappy trophy list and just the game in a leaderboard. So the caravan and high score modes in multiple regions did not exist yet. So it'll be interesting if they actually give the Switch owners an upgraded version of Double Dragon because otherwise they'll just have the normal game. Which is fine, it's a good game, but it'll be really jarring comparing old Arcade Archives tiles to the new ones. Speaking of enhancements, uh, we can kind of go into how these games are being enhanced and what what Hamster is doing to make them a little bit better, I guess, um, considering all of the options and all of that. I guess we can start with, like, what are some of the options that Hamster enables to really make the experience uh, a bit better? Well, for one thing, starting from, I'm not sure, because there's so many games they released from Ninja Beats to Konami and all sorts of people. I think from Gradius 2 or Salamander onwards, they started to do the high school and caravan modes, and then they just put them in every game as a default setting. Which, for some games, like, because the Neo Geo games all have this, because they came out after the second wave of Arcade Archives, where the high score was newly added, so that means for Neo Geo games, who are a lot of them are Street Fighter 2 clones until the mid-90s, it can be actually kind of fun to get high scores because arcade fighting games are fast and you need to go fast but also need to do well in order to get a high score. But games like Polestar, which just came out last week, despite being a shooter where the main goal is getting a high score, the high score mode really sucks because you don't actually get anything worth close to being on the leaderboards until you beat the second stage without a continue. And so some games are better for the high score caravan bonus modes than others. And high score modes literally just going through the game without a continue, and caravan's the 5 minute timer mode. But the problem with these modes is that if you pause at any point, even on accident, it'll disable the entire one you have to reset the game. Which can kind of suck on the Switch because it's portable and you need to be online to do those modes. But the normal mode can be played offline. As for the normal universal enhancements that's been there since the beginning, there's a manual that tells you about the game, even if some of them have funny typos that I'll get into later with the vs Mario Brothers one. And they also have button combination changes, and also they have game settings for the dip switches and stuff. You can't actually see the dip switches, but they all do the same thing and it's much more simplified. Fun fact, even from the very first release of Wygar, all of these sound effects in the Arcade Archives menus all ripped directly from Nikolai's um, Sudoku games on the 3DS. I mean, that's a way of uh, saving on doing those sound effects, I guess. Yeah, I remember back in the 3DS Virtual Console was having the awful, awful North American drought of spring of 2012 where Kirby's Block Ball took four months to release outside Europe and Japan. That uh, Hamster was releasing Nikolai, no, Sudoku by Nikolai and Sliverlink by Nikolai, along with tons of other obscure Japanese pen and paper games. And I bought Sliverlink and Akari. Akari is actually a fun obscure free yes eShop gem. But Sliverlink, it's so confusing, boring, and frustrating. It's like Sudoku, but evil. 
Needless to say, they all use the same boring sound effects that the Hamster Arcade Archives menus do. So needless to say, when I heard um, Guardius's Arcade Archives menu for the first time, I had flashbacks. I will say that even if the sound effects might sound generic, I personally don't mind them as much. I think they provide kind of uh, ambiotic feeling, kind of surrounding. Yeah, actually, I this may sound like a bit of a diss considering how my normally am considered to be one of the, according to some people I read on who I read comments from on the internet, I consider be I'm considered be one of the most pessimistic people about the Switch because of the new eye well sucking. But actually the sound effects are despite how they come from a Sudoku game, they actually do fit the arcade archives line well, so hey, it works. And it's more charming than the Nintendo Switch UI because on the Switch, even though I don't think the, uh, the icons are as pretty as on Xbox One because it's all green, and the Xbox One art icons actually use the box art, or in the case of the Neo Geo stuff, some of the arcade flyers instead of the, well, random screenshot from the game. So I wish we got the green Neo Geo box art slash arcade flyers set up for the well, Switch Arcade Archives, but hey, you can't get everything. And I do think the icons and the menu sounds nice. Now, one thing I really want to get into is the plethora of options that exist for these games. As much as maybe it's a rapid departure from the Virtual Console, it's still pretty cool because here's the thing. Uh, from my perspective, I'm a user who never really got into Arcade Archives um, until it hit on the Nintendo Switch. And so I've always been used to the virtual console that's been on the Wii and Wii U. And while Nintendo's provided, you know, save states, or excuse me, suspend points, and some other stuff, um, the Arcade Archives has a like huge amount of options. Like some things you would probably see in community emulators. Um, some of them I see are like screen filters. I see you know backgrounds you can put into it. Um, the audio could... reverb effects. Yeah, I was really surprised going into it. Um, they, I, I will admit, they did a really good job with, uh, like, how much you can customize how the game sounds, feels, and looks. I really do like that they put that in there, even if not a lot of people are gonna use it because they think it's too complicated. So... Yeah, yeah I, even if, for example, even if you want to, you could be a nutcase and make Versus Super Mario Brothers play upside down with audio reverb that makes the brass go like really sound funny and basically make the game a complete mess. Exactly. You can do whatever you want to the game. I mean, it, say if you're done playing Versus Super Mario Brothers and want to play it in a different way, you set it upside down and just be like, all right, I love the reverse gravity effect. Super Mario Galaxy, here we go. <laughs> You the know. worst, the worst part about all the features, though, is that the one feature you mentioned earlier is really bad on the arcade archives, and that's the suspense state or the save state. At least for Gradius on the PS4, when I used it, because the final levels is a big pain. Uh, it only activates whenever you exit the game and go into the game. It's a suspense state. So that means anytime you want to load it, you have to exit the entire game, not the app, but like the game, and go to the menu where you choose the regions or high score modes, and then go back into the same mode, and then it will load it automatically. So if you are stuck in a hard section, you have to do a lot of exiting and entering and exiting and entering. It's a big pain. And you can't even delete the save state, so once you are like, you beat the game, you better save again or else you will have to restart. It's a big mess. Another grab I do personally have about those is that when you're asked to put in a coin, essentially, I've always had a hard time because I'm so used to the face buttons that um, I, and I think you can like um, change that button, button combination up but um, I'm not used to using the shoulder button, so I would just be pressing A, and I'll be like, okay, what's going on? Oh yeah, I need to press the shoulder buttons. And I'll press the left one, that won't work. Left, right one, that won't work, so I have to press the upper bumper, and it's like, that's not, if you could tell me up front what button I need to push in order to put in a coin, that'd be great. <laughs> 
I actually like the feeling of inputting coins that way. It's kind of funny to explain it, but it feels really simple and fluid, especially with an OK stick, because you just hit two buttons and you're off. And I think it's pretty nifty. But I will say the one thing about the coin slots that, he, well, they don't really need to fix it, but inputting 99 coins from some of those evil games, I wish I didn't have to do that for like 30, not 30 minutes, but like at least two minutes of t mashing the L button to get 99 credits. Right, so it, it just takes too long to put that many credits, you know, when you just want, like, an infinite amount. And where's the free play modes? Like, in some of these arcade games, like the original Mario Brothers, I know for a fact has a free play mode, but you can't activate any of them. So it's kind of funny. Why even bother playing in coins for some of the games? Yeah, that is kind of weird. They should have been a little bit more intuitive to at least include them, like, even if the game didn't support a free play mode at first, they should have had just like, all right, you want 99 coins? Just press this button, here you go. And funnily enough, the versus, not versus mode, the high score and caravan modes actually automatically start the game for you. Like, you don't input a coin, they just take control from you, and it starts up automatically. Okay, that sounds... Interesting, although I'm a guy who rather wants to start the game manually, so yeah, that's... I don't know, that, that's something they really need to work on, it's just, while there's a lot of options, they just need to smooth everything over with the, you know, suspend points and uh, uh, being able to input a coin. They really need to work on that. Some people have also complained about the prices of these games, and honestly, I don't see much of a problem with it in terms of the real arcade games. Now, the Neo Geo stuff, yeah, that's a bit overpriced. Not some games. Some games like Daryl Mark of the Wolves and whatnot feel like they're beefy enough with lots of replay value to be worth the $8. But you are pretty crazy if you tell me a game like Top Hunter, Wadi, and Kathy, or Aero Fighters, which are fun games but only like take 45 minutes to beat and don't have much replay value for high scores, should be worth $8. Yeah, um, really each game should be priced based on its own merits, I should feel. I honestly think the Neo Geo line should be priced at $6 while the Arcade Archives line should be priced at 8 People complain about Arcade Mario Bros. and especially versus Super Mario Bros. being $8 compared to the 5 that NES versions were, but for the arcade experience, I think it's worth the price, especially considering how obscure they are. Plus two, they're not really factoring in what we talked about earlier, and that is, you know, the filters they put in, and overall, the quality of emulation. I've really rarely seen any graphical glitches in these games. Yeah. Oh god, that reminds me. Remember the first month of the eShop when the Arcade Archive Neo Geo games looked like utter darkness? Yeah, I remember that, yep. I played Shark Troopers to the end in that setting with a friend, and even on the TV I had to squint with my already weak eyes to see anything that was going on, and I legitimately thought it was a deliberate thing that Hamster had to do because Nintendo didn't want him to have seizure flashes. I mean, it makes sense in practice, but you don't want to make it so that you can't see the game, so... Yeah, people complained the NES filter on the Wii U was too dark. I had no problem with it, but I would like it to be a bit brighter, especially now that I've seen Super Mario Bros. on the Arcade Archives looking much brighter than the, even the 3DS and Animal Crossing GameCube version, which is the brightest outside the original system, from my experience, for NES games. Right, so... Uh, I think they eventually fixed that, maybe? They fixed I... it in April for... No, it, actually, let's see. It was the week after NOM 1975. Yeah, the week after NOM 1975, which came out a week after launch. So two weeks after launch, they fixed it. Okay, all right, that makes sense. Thankfully, it didn't last forever, so... They said it was because of bad compression when putting it to the Switch, and I don't blame them because... Well, actually, no. Now that I think about it, none of the games that came out at launch were on the PS4 already, to my knowledge, except for maybe King of... No, King of Fires 98 wasn't. All of them were not on PS4 or Xbox One. They were exclusive to Switch for a while, and I think PS4 is just now getting Shock Troopers next month, after we've had it for, like, since March. But then again, they had tons and tons of normal Arcade Archives games that we were catching up on, so it's a fair trade-off. It's pretty interesting that the Switch is getting some exclusive titles as well, so 
I mean, hey, good on Nintendo for securing some of that. Yeah, I was blown away despite my disappointment with the Switch's new eye, the eShop being horribly organized, and all sorts of problems to, well, no internet browser or anything charming outside the games. I was blown away and excited like a little kid when Nintendo announced their Arcade Archives partnership because arcade games were not on the Virtual Console Arcade from them, or anyone for that matter, outside like two companies. Well, three, I, I guess. I think what a lot of people forget though is that um, on the Wii Virtual Console, there was actually some um, arcade titles on there too. They just weren't the original Nintendo arcade games. They were from Tecmo, Capcom, and Sega, and Sega was like M2, which basically was like, I had Space Harrier, and that was kind of a boring port. Oh, Namco had like four games, but in Japan they had 88 arcade games on the Wii Virtual Console, which I'm jealous of. It was literally like Namco Museum, but of course we didn't get any of the cool stuff. We just got lame stuff. I think Wonder Boy, no wait, that got pulled to PS3 with trophies, so no. In the Wii Virtual Console version of Wonder Boy in Monster Land, which was fully translated when it wasn't translated before, even that was, like, not as cool as on the other systems. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what us American gamers have to deal with, is that if, if there's, you know, a huge Virtual Console library being announced, they're all just gonna go to the Japan. <laughs> Except for Commodore 64, which I really, really wish did not get pulled because that stupid Last Ninja 3 incident. Well, believe it or not, Commodore Games released a game on the Virtual Console where it would crash after level 1 and it was a Last Ninja 3 on the European Virtual Console and it took a year and a half I believe, or at least a year, for European Wii owners to get refunded and because of that they never released any other Commodore 64 games in the Virtual Console and they delisted all of them in 2013. I will say though, uh, next year, the entire Wii Shop channel will die, so... Oh yeah, I'm sad about the Turbo Graphics babies that are gonna be lost. I can't believe that Eastbook 1 and 2 will now be rare again. Everyone, buy Eastbook 1 and 2 on the Wii Virtual Console. I know I'm shooting this in the middle of a random discussion, but do it! I, I guess we can kind of segue now into the future of Arcade Archives and mention the interesting comments the CEO of Hamster had to say. So, according to our friends at Japanese Nintendo, the CEO of a Hamster had an interview with Famitsu, where he pretty much stated that out of the 50 games that are already released worldwide, he wants to get to a goal of, okay, I I'm, I'm gonna say this with at, le at least with the least intensity as possible. 800 games. And I don't know how many games are in the Neo Geo library. Let me look it up. I do know for a fact there's so many arcade ar arcade games out there. At least 3,000. There has to be 3,000 normal arcade games. But Neo Geo MVS line, like, games. I think there are only like 284 or something. I heard there's 280. Okay, there's only 148 games released for the Neo Geo. So we are, on the Neo Geo side, we are almost, almost halfway to the whole library. Pretty much, and then the rest could be just Nintendo's arcade archives or what other, whatever system they're gonna bring up next. Well, they had lots of Konami and now IWIM games. They got IWIM recently. We got Travis USA, which is a fun little motorbike game, and R-Type is coming next month. And they got title games too. Frontline came out on the PS4 in Japan last week. That's actually uh, interesting. Huh. They also they also got Capcom, not Capcom. They got Konami, and they had Tecmo for a while, but I don't think they've been able to work out anything past Weigar and uh, I think only Weigar and Star Force maybe. I think just Weigar is the only one they got released. No wait. They got a sumo wrestling game released next to Weigar. So yeah, no Ninja Gaiden, oh, sadly. Okay, that's, uh, alright. Well, I mean, I guess this, this allows us to kind of segue into Nintendo's arcade archives, and we can kind of go into, you know, how did, what was our first experiences with them prior to them being released to the arcade archives, so... Like, lots of people have grown up with Mario Brothers, especially Donkey Kong, but that's not happening for a reason I'll discuss in a bit. And some people have grew up with a couple of the Versus games, but the obscure ones, especially one that's upcoming, I know not many people, if any, have experienced. 
So any that you've grown up with Nintendo wise or have tried on some Shadow Realms before? I will say Mario Brothers. That that is the one game I've grown up with quite a lot. Um, the original arcade Mario Brothers I did uh, through the Game Boy Advance remakes of the Super Mario Advance series. So I've played that version quite a lot. I've played the original arcade version somewhere. I can't remember where I did. Uh, no, it was the NES ports of the arcade version that I played. So through the virtual console. So I've played that variant I before. I was going to say, Nintendo made three different versions of Mario Brothers on the NES. They made the stripped-down, boring one that's on every virtual console. They made a German-exclusive arcade remake where it has all the intermissions, the cutscenes, and whatnot. But in the NES graphical style, the controls are like a lot better, like they control like normal Mario games. And they have this weird food company, noodle company crossover in Japan called on the Famicom Disk System. I can't pronounce the name, I think it's like called Ketsusen Mario Brothers. It's a noodle company crossover. You collect noodles. Hmm. That's actually, that's actually hilarious. <laughs> Thinking about it. But as for me, I have a lot of experience with Nintendo's arcade games. Not all of them, but some of them, well, through means I don't like the mitt. But, let's see, Donkey Kong, that was one of the first ones I played. I played the NES version of Death and Animal Crossing. And I played an actual arcade, not the original cabinet, but I played a multi-cave, those dreaded bootleg Chinese knockoffs of multiple worms in one. And I was okay at it. And then I played the rare Donkey Kong 64 arcade remake that they made, where they edited the worm to fix a legal issue. And I actually had to beat it for the main story. I actually like it more than Donkey Kong 64, which says a lot about what I think about Donkey Kong 64. And for the most part, Donkey Kong on the arcade was, well, yeah, a lot harder than the NES version, but still a fun game until it got to start. Donkey Kong Jr., I have actually played the real arcade cabinet several times. And the NES version is pretty close to the original, so that's my favorite of Donkey Kongs. Donkey Kong and... Donkey Kong Jr. or Donkey Kong 3, I think it was Donkey Kong 3, was in the multi cade with Mario Brothers, and that's how I played both of those games. And Donkey Kong 3 is average. Mario Brothers is fun. I'm glad it was on the arcade archives. But by far the most obscure bundle of games I've played from Nintendo's past have been the Punch-Out. That's one of them, and that's coming soon, but we don't know when. I played it at a local amusement park, and there was the original cabinet. But I think it was Super Punch-Out, because that Bear Hugger, and I don't think he's in the first one. But they look exactly the same in terms of the graphics. Mm -hmm. I think Super Punch-Out was really made using the code of the original, as common at the time. And I've now launched the Versus system, the stuff that a lot of Nintendo owners are not familiar with because I've actually played several of the original Versus arcade cabinets. And those are versus Gradius, which is literally Gradius. Nothing is changed outside of some scoring tables. It's boring, it's just NES Gradius, which is not as good as the real thing. And what got me into Castlevania, versus Castlevania, one of the worst arcade versus system games out there. And I actually had the pleasure of playing the real arcade version in a local game store before they auctioned it off to a bar. See, um, I always found those arcade cabinets really interesting because they I, they were kind of related to the Play Choice arcade cabinets that Nintendo had, and they were the only pieces of machinery that I know of that had the official RGB palettes for Nintendo uh, Entertainment System games, because the original NES. Um, never really had an official RGB palette. It was just um, composite all the way through. So it was, if you wanted a full, like, official, and I put this in quotes, um, just imagine me quoting my fingers, you know, if you have an imagination. But um, uh, basically, if you wanted an official Nintendo um, color palette, that was the way to do it back then. It, it was weird. But of course, now with emulation, we have more official, we have better looking ones than the overly yellow 
um, one of uh, the RG the old Play Choice RGB palette. Speaking of Play Choice, they the old game store had a Play Choice in it, and I remember it had games like Mario Three, Mario One, Contra, Double Dragon, The Goonies, the first one that wasn't released, and I wish I played it because it's the only American release of that game, and Lonoid, that Pizza Hut or oh, Domino's, they are the same. Um, game and it was I played that and it was awful. I don't want to do it again. <laughs> and I actually remember now they did have versus Super Mario Brothers, but like Gradius, it was a cocktail sit down version. And they also had balloon fights. Yeah, they had a sit down version of that game. That game's weird. It uses like a dual screen mechanism. It's kind of goofy looking. It's really different than the NES version, so you should check it out. And technically. Versus Clue Crew Land was ported to the GameCube on Animal Crossing as part of Animal Crossing NES game, and it's called Clue Crew Land D because it's a disc system port. Okay, that's it's, uh, that's I mean those virtual con excuse me those um arcade cabinets that Nintendo released had some really interesting alterations that were made to the games that were you know featured within uh within the Play Choice cabinets uh. They're, like you said, they're really, really small. Um, they don't really impact much sometimes, uh, but it's still interesting to see how they change those games. Some of the games are completely different. Um, the most noticeable versus games that are different are Duck Hunt, where you can shoot the dog in the bonus game, and a lot of music's changed, and Ice Climber, where they expanded the game, add new enemies, add new level types. It's a lot of fun. That was one I played on, well, the E word, emulator, when I was like, I don't know, 12? Because I wanted to play more Ice Climbers, one of my favorite NES games, and I couldn't find the arcade version, so I just, well, downloaded it before deleting it the same day. But now I get to have the original arcade version on my Switch, and I'm so excited for it, along with Clue Clue Land. But there were also some weird ones like Pinball, which is NES Pinball with, mo with music. And there's also Mark Rider, which has like a scene of the Mark Rider taking off a helmet like Samus, and it was done before Samus was even a, a character. Also Gumshoe, which I want to come to the arcade archives badly, but it needs a light gun to function. And there was no light gun games yet, but it's a game that's so hard, but also so good. The thing is, with those light gun games, uh, games uh, I do think that they could use the right Joy-Con's IR sensor. So... Yeah, but can... it's, it's nothing compared to the Wii Zapper that the Wii U Virtual Console would allow you to use. That was the best way to play those games. There's also yeah. Versus Ladies Golf, that Wii skin of the NES Golf, which also got Wii skin into a men's golf on the Versus system. And it's nearly Versus men's golf with a girl character. But it's really cool because all the courses are different. It's always cool seeing the different versions of each game. Um, as a little side note, uh, it, it's fun to see all the different versions of Super Mario Brothers that exist. You have the Versus version, you have the All Might Nippin Super Mario Brothers, you have the original game, you have the special that was released on the Hudson, it was like on a Hudson, Hudson system. Hudson PC-8801, it's one of the buggiest versions of the game that exist. Don't buy it. Well, you can't. It's PC-88s are literally dying, so maybe that's a good thing. Wait, no it's not, because East is dying, that's a great game. But yeah, there's a lot of versions of Mario Brothers, and Versus Super Mario Brothers is pretty interesting. It came out like a few days ago, so let's share our thoughts on it, because I'm sure, I don't know if you played it, but I know I played it in arcades and now again on the Switch. And let's just sum it up. It's Super Mario Brothers with more pits. Basically, think of Super Mario Brothers uh, versus Super Mario Brothers as the precursor to the Lost Levels. Some of the levels that were in that version, rich and just made to gobble up quarters, were put into Lost Levels, and it has the same UI as Lost Levels too, which is really neat. Six three is one of the hardest ones. It's one of the hardest levels from Lost Levels, and it was added to the last levels later down the line, but debuted in Versus. It's 6-3 in Versus, and it has a super stupid jump with like the Koopa Troopers over air and it's and springs. And yeah, that's Lost Level territory, but it's not as hard as Lost Levels despite being an arcade game. Lost Levels was a lot more evil. No, uh, Versus I think was meant to be 
challenging, but not too challenging to the point where they're not going to make money. Because if you make a game deliberately hard, a lot of the a lot of the people who are putting in quarters are going to be like, all right, I'm done. Word's going to get around, and you're not going to get any money. But since they cross that balance territory, people are going to be like, I want to go further, and they get more money that way. And you get more quarters because you died in that hard level. So that's why they moved the warp zone from like the 4-2 warp zone to make it only take you to world 6 You can't jump any farther than that, which means you have to go through 6-3 and that's where the stopping point is for most people Right, and that's where the level from hell exists, so <laughs> Thankfully worlds A, D, and 9 from lost levels are nowhere to be found, so you're safe but yeah, it's a very fun remix, and it's not one of the most crazy ones like Clue Clue Land, Urban Champion, or Ice Climbers. Oh, and Excite Bike, which got ported to the Famicom Disk System, was a really virtual console game. And actually, the the Famicom Disk System version of Versus Excite Bike is a lot better than the arcade one, because unlike Clue Clue Land, they added stuff, they added track editor. So you don't get that when the Versus Excite Bike comes out. They also have Wrecking Crew, I've never seen that before, so it would be brand new. But I'm going to talk about, this may sound stupid, especially to people who hate this game. I actually love it because it's similar to Game & Watch Boxing, a game I grew up with. And I bet I hear some people in the comments going, Oh no, this kid with an annoying voice is now talking about a game I hate. Well, guess what? Versus Urban Champion is so rare, it's never been dumped. And there's only like one gameplay video of it on Nico Nico. And it's confirmed for an Arcade Archives release, like, next year. So somehow they got that ultra rare, never before seen, essentially, Nintendo Arcade game coming soon, and it's Urban Champion. And the difference is it has music, it has a few more enemy types, and by that I mean there's more skin colors on the enemies. I think there's now a brown enemy, and I think there's, like, some, like, lighter green, like, the hair color is different. It's just Urban Champion, but with music and different skin colors. And I think there's a ranking system, like the 3D Classics version. I'm not sure. It's not the same. But it's basically meant to be a high score chase instead of get to the furthest round. Hmm. I mean, that might, uh, that might make people want to buy the game more just a bit because it's like, alright, let's try this game once more. Yeah, what well, people consider be Nintendo's worst black box NES game, even though Donkey Kong Jr. Math is worse in my opinion, it actually has a lot of differences that I hope people will check out, because for one thing, it's never been released before and it's heck not even been dumped. You can't even play it on an emulator, it's that rare. So, when will uh, Urban Champion Math be released? Oh, speaking of which, I wonder if they'll ever find... It's not an arcade game, but I wonder if they'll actually go and dig up that Donkey Kong Teaches Music game that was gonna come out. Like Donkey Kong Jr. Math, but with music, they cancelled it after Donkey Kong Jr. Math did poorly. Anyways, with that, that's all the time we have left. So, we want to thank you guys for watching. Be sure to follow us on our social media pages, including our Facebook and Twitter accounts. Be sure to also support us on Patreon to receive exclusive perks. Everything will be linked in the description below, including our newly opened public Discord server. We hope you guys enjoyed the video, and we will see you in the next one.